Hello, everybody. I am John Allen, the editor of Crux, and your host here on Last Week in the Church, where we sort through the major headlines in the Vatican and the global church from the past week looking for those few nuggets of gold. Now, this week is going to be a kind of eclectic episode of the program. We are going to have a few news headlines, but yesterday, Monday, was also D-Day in the Vatican, by which I don't mean that the Vatican invaded Europe. What I mean is it was the one decade anniversary for Pope Francis. It was 10 years ago, as of Monday, March 13th, 2013, when he was elected to the throne of Peter. So we are also going to throw in a kind of analysis of where things stand for Pope Francis at the one decade mark. All that and more is waiting for you this week on Last Week in the Church. So please, for the love of God, stick around. All right, everybody, happy Tuesday to you. Thank you for being with us once again here on Last Week in the Church. As we mentioned, yesterday was the big day. It was the one decade anniversary of the Francis Papacy. And actually, to be honest, despite the sort of monumental nature of the moment, right, because I think we would all agree, this has been a dizzying, a dramatic, even a divisive decade with Pope Francis at the top of the Catholic system. But despite all that, the Vatican really didn't play it up particularly. There was a mass with cardinals in the morning to mark the Pope's anniversary. In the afternoon, one of the Pope's closest friends and advisors, Jesuit Father Antonio Spadaro, presented a new book called The Atlas of Francis, or the Franciscan Atlas, basically the international diplomacy and politics of the Pope Francis era at the headquarters of Chipotle Cattolica, that's the Jesuit edited publication, semi-official Vatican status that Spadaro leads, and was in the presence of the Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Maloney. Pope didn't even show up for that. So really, other than the mass with cardinals, Pope Francis did not go out of his way to make a big deal out of this anniversary, but that's okay because plenty of other people, including us, made a big deal out of it for him. So on this week's show, we are going to very briefly traipse through a few news headlines from the past week. Then I'm going to offer you a kind of, well, I'm going to admit it, a deliberately inexact and also deliberately jarring analogy, but one that is intended to try to capture the crossroads which the Francis Papacy stands right now. All right, let's begin with those news headlines. So the Vatican's trial of the century, that is, this mega trial for financial corruption against 10 different defendants, including for the first time, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, Italian Cardinal Angelo Becciu, continued last week. And, and probably the single most interesting development was that prosecutors in the case introduced into evidence an exchange of letters between Pope Francis and Becciu, which dates from July 2020, basically when the indictments in this case were first delivered. And you could call this sort of the Pope's Dear John letter, although, of course, it's actually Dear Angelo, because the figure in question is Cardinal Angelo Becciu. But it's a Dear John letter in the sense that it's kind of a pretty clear breakup between the two parties. Basically, what happened is this. Bechu, knowing that he had been indicted, wrote the Pope to say, look, you know, under ordinary circumstances, I would have to call you as a witness to demonstrate that I'm innocent. I'm hoping we can avoid that if you will just agree to put in writing a couple of things which would have the effect of getting me off the hook. Didn't put it quite like that, but that was the gist of it. And the two things had to do, number one, with the kidnapping of a Colombian nun in Mali by Islamic jihadists, for which the Vatican helped pay a ransom. And Bechu was charged with using an intermediary, a woman by the name of Cecilia Maronia, and overpaying her for her services. So that was one thing he wanted the Pope's assist on. Basically, he wanted the Pope to say that whole thing was covered by pontifical secrecy and therefore it couldn't be the subject of cross-examination at a trial. And the other thing was the, this London property deal, this $400 million purchase of a piece of property in the Tony London neighborhood of Chelsea, 
which went horribly wrong from the Vatican's point of view. Basically, Bechu wanted the Pope to say that, you know, Bechu brought it to the Pope, the Pope found it interesting, passed it on to other people, basically the suggestion being that Bechu had done nothing wrong. And he even provided handy dandy little drafts of two paragraphs that the Pope could agree to. Basically, Francis wrote back to say, no dice, no deal, no, not going to do it. Essentially saying, look, as you well know, I found the proposal you brought to me about London a little weird. That's why I said you should discuss it with Cardinal Pyroline, the Secretary of State, and also with the head of the Vatican's financial secretariat at the time, a Jesuit by the name of Father Guerrero. And as far as the Mali thing goes, that's not covered by pontifical secrecy. The question here has to do with illicit transfers of money, and that, by definition, can't be covered by pontifical secrecy. The overall gist, obviously, of introducing this correspondence is, let's be honest, to make Bechu look bad. Basically speaking, it makes it look like he was trying to connive the Pope into getting him off the hook, and the Pope basically didn't buy it. And that undoubtedly is at least part of the story here. Of course, the question it leaves unanswered is how a transaction that basically most of the key moves unfolded after Bechu was no longer the Pope's chief of staff and with Francis's full approval, how Bechu can be made the fall guy for that, that's still a little bit unclear. You know, we'll see as the trial proceeds. All right, second news story, the Orlandi case. This is the Vatican girls saga the disappearance of a 15-year-old girl whose family lived on Vatican grounds because her father worked in the prefecture of the papal household in 1983, which has gone on to become the Vatican's most enduring mystery story, right? We've had occasion to talk about it many times in this program. The latest developments are that the Vatican hasn't had announced, and by, by the Vatican, I mean, the promoter of justice in the Vatican, basically it's, I guess you could say it's DA, had announced that they were going to open an investigation. This because the Italian parliament also has opened its own investigation, and there's a lot of pressure around the case because of a very popular four-part Netflix documentary called Vatican Girl. All right. Now, here's the most, the interesting development from the past week. The Vatican has always maintained that prior to this point, it has never conducted an actual investigation of the Yolandi case. It has cooperated with all the civil investigations that have been done, but it's always maintained we don't have any documentation ourselves. We don't have any secret files, you know, because she didn't disappear on Vatican grounds. She disappeared in downtown Rome. This was a case for the Italian civil authorities. Basically, we had nothing to do with it. We've answered questions when asked, but that's it. That's always been their claim. Well, this week, it turns out that a former Vatican official by the name of Monsignor Valentino Miserax Grau, who was at one point the director of the papal choir at the Basilica of St. Mary Major, and also the head of the Pontifical Institute for Sacred Music, but who in 1983 was a minor Vatican official who moonlighted as a music teacher and who was the voice teacher, the singing teacher for Emanuela Orlandi, and therefore the last person to see her on June 22, 1983, the day she disappeared. It, it turns out that 10 years ago, he was summoned by the head of the Vatican gendarmes, who at the time was an Italian layman by the name of Domenico Gianni, and also by the assessore, in the Secretary of State at the time, that's number three official, who at that moment was an American by the name of Peter Wells, who is now the, the nuncio in South Africa. And this guy, Mizorak Skrau, was essentially interviewed by them. Now, listen, this is the, the Vatican gendarmes, their police force. That means there certainly had to be a transcript of that interview, what the Italians call a verbale, which means there is some kind of file, at least, on the Orlandi case. Now, Mizorak Skrau said he didn't know if he was the only person talked to or if there were others that the gendarmes interviewed at the same time. Worth noting that this was just a few days before the Vicariate of Rome agreed to open the tomb of a guy by the name of Enrico de Pedis, an infamous Roman mob boss who, through a bizarre set of circumstances, had been buried 
in a crypt in the Basilica of St. Apollinare in Rome. And there had actually been speculation that maybe Orlandi's body was in that same crypt. So the Vicariate of Rome finally agreed to open it up. Orlandi was not discovered, but it was around that time. Point is, we now know that the Vatican did at one point conduct some sort of investigation, and there have to be some kind of records. The question is, what happened? Why haven't they been disclosed? And are they going to be made available to this new investigation? All I can say is, stay tuned. Finally, just very quick before we move on, On the occasion of the Pope's 10th anniversary, there has been, what would I call it, an avalanche, a tidal wave, a tsunami of new Pope interviews. In the last, oh, 72 hours, by my count, there are at least four, and I probably have missed some. But two of these were with Argentinian outlets, one with an Italian newspaper, and one with a Swiss TV station. Now, for the most part, these interviews didn't create major headlines. The Pope largely repeated things he has said before, but just a couple of tidbits worth picking up. First, in one of them, he talked about priestly celibacy. And while he did not say he is on the verge of getting rid of priestly celibacy, he did say that this is a discipline, not a dogma. He said, it's here today. There's no reason it couldn't be gone tomorrow. And, you know, I mean, now that we've all known that, you know, since the debate about celibacy arose, but to have a Pope saying it out loud, certainly is likely to encourage those who believe that celibacy ought to either be eliminated or at least, you know, maybe made optional for priests of the Latin rite. Another note, Pope talked about Ukraine, said the Vatican has no secret peace plan for Ukraine, but it wants to be of service in the efforts to bring an end to the Ukraine conflict. The Pope emphasized once again, He would very much like to go to Kiev, but he will only go if he can also go to Moscow. He wants to meet both with Zelensky and with Putin. He suggested the Vatican might be a place for a face-to-face encounter between Zelensky and Putin. Suggested that it might not just be the Vatican that could help engineer that, but other parties, including, he mentioned, the State of Israel, which, of course, today has 1.5 million Russian-speaking immigrants, and therefore has been keenly involved in the negotiations surrounding the Ukraine conflict from the beginning. So all this by way of saying the Pope continues to remain highly engaged with Ukraine. One other point of note, that in these interviews, he also went out of his way to say nice things about both Vladimir Putin of Russia, who in one of these interviews he referred to as a very cultured man, He noted they have met three times. He said one time he and Putin discussed literature. He noted that in addition to Russian, Putin speaks very fluent English and German. And basically said he's a very cultured man with whom one can have conversations at a very high level. And then of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in India, the Pope called him a very balanced figure and said that he was optimistic that Modi was the kind of person who could appeal to both Zelensky and Putin and perhaps move the ball in terms of creating space for peace negotiations. Now, what's interesting about all this is that this is not the kind of rhetoric that you would hear from most Western leaders today. I mean, Joe Biden is not going to have too many nice things to say about Vladimir Putin right now. Neither will Ursula von der Leyen, who is the head of the European Commission, or neither will Emmanuel Macron or Georgia Maloney of Italy or most other European leaders. You know, as far as Modi goes, you know, Western nations are trying to do business with Modi, but they also know that Modi's record on human rights and democracy is a little challenged, and he's also acquiring a reputation as somebody who is promoting currents hostile to religious freedom, including hostile to India's Christian minority, which doesn't play well in in some Western circles. And so to see Pope Francis praising these two leaders, it's just, it's another reminder of how Pope Francis is making it clear to the world that he is not a Western leader. He is the leader of an institution, two-thirds of whose membership lives outside the West. It lives in the global South, and by mid-century, that's going to be three quarters. Now, we've always known that demographically, but Pope Francis is making that clear geopolitically and diplomatically. That's jarring to Western sensitivities, but it's also an apt reminder 
that that is who and where the Catholic Church is these days. All right, finally, before we go, a quick thought on the Pope's 10-year anniversary. As I said at the beginning, I am going to acknowledge that the analogy I'm about to roll out is inexact and deliberately provocative. Nevertheless, bear with me. So, Pope Francis was elected a decade ago on a clear reform mandate, right? The cardinals who elected him, to begin with, they wanted him to clean up the perceived financial and administrative mess in the Roman Curia, that is, the Vatican's central bureaucracy. More broadly, Pope Francis also wanted to revive the reforming spirit that he associated with the Second Vatican Council in the mid-1960s. He has set about, and he's a strong leader with a clear vision, so he has set about on multiple fronts trying to chart a new course for the Catholic Church. This is a church where seemed its course seemed sort of frozen in time for 35 years under two, broadly speaking, conservative popes, John Paul II and Benedict XVI. And so there was a lot of pent-up energies for change that accumulated during those 35 years that have been unleashed under Pope Francis. And the question that now poses itself is whether Pope Francis, the reformer, is going to be able to contain the energies he has set loose, or whether they are going to run ahead and beyond his own intentions. Here's the analogy. Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Gorbachev, the last premier of the Soviet Union, like Pope Francis, came to power on a reform mandate, like Pope Francis. He wanted to shake up an institution that had seemed frozen in time. He wanted to revitalize it, set it on a new course, and encourage internal change. Like Pope Francis, he was very popular abroad. Mikhail Gorbachev was a rock star around the world, but he was very controversial at home. Gorbachev, like Pope Francis, encountered opposition both from the right that is, in, Gorbach in Gorbachev's case, these would be hardcore Soviet hawks, right, who didn't want to see the Soviet empire change. But he also encountered opposition from the left. These would be liberals that wanted to see that change go farther and faster than Gorbachev was comfortable with. Same story for Pope Francis, isn't it? I mean, he's got strong opposition from the Catholic right, including, most recently, traditionalists who are upset about his policies on the Latin mass, and so on. But he also has problems and headaches on the left, doesn't he? The most recent reminder of that comes from Germany, where the controversial synodal way in Germany ended with a vote in favor of blessing same-sex unions, a policy that is explicitly at odds with instructions given by the Vatican's former congregation, now dicastery, for the doctrine of the faith, and not quite clear exactly what is going to happen should Pope Francis try to rein in these, these changes that the German church has now formally voted to endorse and adopt. So like Gorbachev before him, Pope Francis is beset both on the right and the left. And the drama here is, is Pope Francis going to be able to put the genie back in the bottle? Can, can he contain these centrifugal energies that, that he has triggered, or are they going to run ahead of him and end up not in the reform that this pope wants, but in the revolution that he is desperately trying to avoid? Gorbachev, of course, failed on that front. And, you know, for the rest of his life, until he died just last year, Gorbachev maintained that had his reform program succeeded, Russia would have been spared the economic collapse of the shock therapy years and would have been spared the return to authoritarianism and imperialism under Vladimir Putin. You know, we don't know because that's a counterfactual claim because in the end, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Gorbachev's Humpty Dumpty back together again. Now, we don't yet know what's going to happen with Pope Francis. What we do know is that there is a live possibility that he may be walking down the same path. That is, he may have triggered energies that in the end are bigger than any one leader can possibly manage. On the other hand, it is also fair to say that the Catholic Church 
has a much longer track record than the Soviet Union did. It has much greater staying power. And it was hardly in the same weakened and internally fragile condition when Pope Francis took over as the Soviet Union was when Gorbachev took over. So point is, Pope Francis certainly has a much greater chance than Gorbachev at keeping all of this together. But on the other hand, the analogy speaks to us because what it says is, after a decade, the Francis papacy is still full of enormous promise, but there is also great peril. In which way things are going to go, we don't yet know. That is both the nerve-wracking, but also the utterly fascinating reality of Pope Francis at the one decade mark. All right, you can find full coverage of all this and much more on the Crux site, that is cruxnow.com. Once again, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism. By the way, I would remind you, when you do visit the site, there is a very easy, user-friendly, handy-dandy way to make a financial contribution to Crux. We depend on the support of our readers and our viewers to pay our bills, to keep the lights on. And so if you can become part of, uh, of our family in that way, we would be enormously grateful, not asking for very much. Maybe what you would spend on a cup of coffee or streaming an Oscar-winning movie this month. You know, whatever it happens to be, but whatever you can do, we would be most grateful. We will be back here next Tuesday, same bat time, same bat channel. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again very soon.